Welcome to The Epic Life with Pastor Bob Hallman. We invite you to listen to this timeless and inspirational message from God's Word. May the Holy Spirit encourage and strengthen your heart today. You know, John has been laying out what it means to be an authentic Christian, what it means to be a genuine Christian. And, uh, and he's laid out a number of things for us that, that the genuine, authentic believer walks in the light, acknowledges and confesses sin, obeys God's commands, and walks as Jesus walked. And, uh, and he's laid out some pretty stiff um, uh, standards for what it means to follow Christ. Today what we're going to look at is his encouragement, his, his affirmation of the believers in their walk with God. Because after getting this far and looking at these high standards, it can almost mean, it can almost give you a feeling like, gee, can anyone consider themselves a Christian? Can anyone live up to that standard? I remember um, teaching in 1 John a number of, of years ago, and uh, by the time we got this far, one of the gals in the group just felt like, am I even a Christian? Because she wasn't seeing a lot of these things take place in her life. And yet she'd really committed her life to Christ. She indeed was a Christian, but uh, uh, she needed some encouragement in her walk to say, yes, you are a believer. Yes, God is working. He's not finished with you yet. He's completing that work. But definitely, because of your commitment to Christ, I see change in your life, and there's definite, a definite work of God going, in your life, going on in your life. And right at this point in this, uh, in this section of 1 John, John interrupts his teaching on the authentic Christian life to affirm and confirm to the believers that they indeed knew Jesus if they'd committed their life to him. And that's where we're picking up in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. John says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. John, in this, uh, in this section, is addressing something that's so important, and I don't think really spoken of enough in the, in the, in the body of Christ, and that's uh, growing up in Christ, the different stages of spiritual development. I think oftentimes um, the church has fallen into the, uh, to the pattern and, and uh, trap of thinking that you come into the kingdom and then you kind of skate to the end. Uh, you get your momentum and then you coast. You, um, you are looking, many people, Christians, they come into the kingdom and then they're looking to be content. They're looking to, for God to give them excitement in their walk with him. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for a connection with him, but they're not necessarily looking to grow up in Christ. They're not thinking necessarily that we need, very much like we do in the physical sense, to expect spiritual, sequential progress in our walk with God. I remember um, watching Funny Home Videos a number of years ago. Everybody watches that show. You remember when it first came out, how we just couldn't get enough of it? It was like the show was so funny. And now it's kind of, you know, it's it, it, same thing over and over. But do you remember the one prank that they pulled where they had this little bassinet and, uh, and they leave it out like in the middle of a mall or something. And inside was, you know, somebody would come by and, and think, be looking for a cute little baby. And they saw this balding guy just, you know, laughing like this. You guys have seen it. Do you remember it? You never saw it? Oh, it's hilarious. And of course, everybody's just freaking out. You know, they're so frightened because what are they expecting? They're expecting to see a little cute, fuzzy baby. And instead, they see a fuzzy old guy. You know, and it's pretty scary. The head almost takes up the whole bassinet, and he's, you know, and he's going like this. You know, so it really scares him. And um, you know, I thought about that, and I, the, the reason that's funny is because there's an element of surprise, and that's a lot of what humor is. Is there's a twist on it? There's some element of surprise, uh, either you know, in, in a scary sense, or just something we didn't expect, and it makes something very ordinary funny. And um, when you look at something like that, it's hilarious. It's, it's funny watching the people's reaction, but if that were really the case, if this guy had never progressed past being in a bassinet with a, a little binky in his mouth, we'd all go, man, this is sick. Something's terribly, terribly wrong. I mean, if the guy's normal and healthy, and he's 30 or 40 years old, still in a bassinet with diapers on, you know, we would be seriously concerned about the parents, or, I mean, you know, we would know something is definitely seriously wrong. And, um, you know, even in developmental psychology, developmental uh, uh, work of any type, whether it's sociology or anything, 
you know, if, if a child is just even a few uh, steps behind his peers, parents get concerned. And they start wondering, is everything okay? Is this baby okay? Like our son, he, he was chattering at like eight months, and then all of a sudden he just stopped. And he hasn't chattered for like a year. And if, we, if, we, if this was our first, we'd probably be wondering, is he okay? Is he gonna talk again? But since it's number two, we, we know, you know he's gonna come along, he'll be just fine. The point is, is that we have certain expectations of, spirit, of, of, of physical development in our children. And we have certain expectations in terms of level of responsibility as our children grow and as we grow. The responsibilities change, the attitudes change, everything changes, we develop, we grow, we mature. And, um, but if, if we saw these things not taking place in our children or in our friends or whatever, we, we, we would definitely be concerned and we would do something to correct that. The, the, the thing that's interesting about this whole topic of spiritual development is that the things of the kingdom are hidden. We don't see each other's spiritual development like we do physical development. And so oftentimes we don't give much attention to the spiritual development in our Christian lives. And some of us uh, have been Christians a long time and we're still maybe not nearly as developed as we should be for the number of years we've known the Lord, but it's kind of a hidden thing. It's, it's sometimes even hidden from us and it's certainly hidden from other people. And so oftentimes we don't show a real deep concern about someone who may be an infant spiritually and yet should be uh, pretty far advanced in the things of the kingdom. And, uh, and, and that's what John is addressing here. He's first of all confirming the position and status of these different levels of maturity, these believers in their walk with God. But he's also laying out that there are expectations for the type of Christian life that we should be living as we grow and mature in the faith. And that is something that we need to be looking for in our own lives. Now, he kind of, this is almost in, in the form of a poem. And, and it's, he, he uh, basically gives a couplet. He, he emphasizes twice each area, the children, the sons, and uh, the young men and the fathers. And he gives information on each of these levels twice. And rather than taking them separately, what I want to do today is look at each of these categories together. And, uh, you know, the, the children, the young men, and the fathers. And if you want to pull your outline out, we'll take a look at some of the characteristics of these different categories. He gives, first of all, assurances to children, spiritual children. And that assurance is of forgiveness. And uh, in the Greek, it's in the perfect tense, and it means they have been and remain forgiven. So all their past sins are forgiven, and they remain in a forgiven state before God because of the work of Christ. And again, uh, just looking at uh, passages in the, in the Bible and elsewhere, uh, it says that he forgave us all our sins in Colossians 2.13. Paul says, even when we were dead in our sins, we were made alive by Christ and he forgave us all our sins. But we're not just forgiven of sins, but we're also assured of our salvation. In 1 John 5, 13, the very book that we're, we're studying, this is the, actually the key verse for the whole book. Uh, it gives the purpose for John's writing. And he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Not, not so that you can guess or so that you can try to figure out if you do, but so that you can know that you have eternal life. I don't know how many of you come from a Catholic background, but I watched a, uh, a, a debate between an evangelical and Catholic a, a number of years ago. Uh, it was apologetics, and they were talking about Christianity and Catholicism. And um, the, the uh, bishop who was part of this debate confessed that you know, no one can know if they're saved. And the evangelical said, you mean not even the pope knows whether he's saved, whether he'll be assured of salvation. And, and the bishop said, no, not even the pope. He will not know until he actually gets there whether he'll be saved or not. And, uh, and the thing that's so exciting about Christianity and the Bible is that the Bible tells us that we can be assured that we are belonging to Christ. And we don't have to be guessing and we don't have to wonder if we'll, if, we're, if we'll have our last rites or not, or whether we'll get prayed, or whether we'll sin just before we go to heaven and lose our salvation. We don't have to be worried about those things because God has given us assurance of our salvation in Christ. But, it, but children also have more than just these assurances of forgiveness and uh, salvation. They have a new relationship with Christ and with the Father. Uh, if you look in this passage again, it, it, uh, going back down to uh, the first uh, section, they've been forgiven on account of their name, but then on, at the end of verse 13, he says, I write to you, children, because you have known the Father. 
the word know here is an intimate uh, knowledge. It's not just a, a head knowledge, but they have an intimate working knowledge of the Father through Jesus Christ. And in John uh, 1, 12, we're told that he gave us the right to become children of God because of the work of Christ, and that we've been made sons um, in Romans 8, 15, and 16, by, where, by, by which we can cry, Abba, Father. So we, we've been made sons and daughters of the Most High. And so John is writing these new believers, and he's saying, you are part of the family of God. Once you came into the kingdom, once you received Jesus as Savior, confessing your sins, renouncing and repenting of your sins, and following Christ, you've been born again. And that's why he refers to them as children. Even though these people might have been 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, it doesn't matter. When you're born again and come into the kingdom, you're considered a child because you're born into a brand new life, a brand new experience, a brand new existence with Jesus Christ. And so John is rejoicing with these young believers. And even though the standards are high for the Christian life, and they are, John says, you have assurance of salvation and you have assurance in your relationship with God that you are his children, his sons, and daughters. And his love for you is completely, uh, uh, completely given to you without reservation. Then he goes on and he talks about the characteristics of young men. He says uh, of the young men, if you look at the end of verse 14, where he talks about young men, he says, you are strong. They're spiritually strong. And, and there are a number of areas where young men, spiritually uh, young men, are strong. They're strong in God's grace and strength. In 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul addresses his disciple and his son in the faith, Timothy. And he says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Young men have a tendency, as we all know, I'm not that far away from being a young man. I, I'm probably not a young man anymore, but... Um, those of us that, uh, that are a little bit older, we remember what it was like to be young. And weren't, you, weren't there times where you were kind of self-confident and cocky? You thought you could grab the world by the tail and you would live forever and anything was possible. Any, any goal that you put in front of yourself was, uh, was achievable. And with the years, you begin to mellow a little bit and become a little bit more circumspect about your abilities and about who you are and uh, hopefully a little bit more humble. And one of the stages, I think, that takes place in the believer, and certainly took place in my life, is I've grown and matured. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not nearly as confident in myself anymore. I have much less confidence in my own strength, my own abilities, my own talents than I used to. Years ago, I thought, man, even in ministry, I thought, I can do anything. I wasn't thinking that carnally in my head, but that's how I was behaving. I was behaving as if, you know, if you just work hard enough and do the right things, that God is going to work and bless. But God has done some things in my life to teach me that it's all grace. It's all grace. I can't do anything to earn God's pleasure. And I have to confess for years as a Christian, as a, as a uh, kind of a cocky young guy, I thought that somehow maybe there was something that I could offer God that would make his investment in me worth his while. Anybody else felt that at times where you you realize at different stages along your Christian growth that you were somehow still trying to win God's approval. The way I knew that I had a problem with this is that I, wasn't, I was feeling like, oh, if only God could love me and demonstrate it in a very practical way so that I knew that he loved me. Desiring somehow to be held by him and for him to say through a, through a prophecy or something, hey, Bob, I'm pleased with you. Right on, keep going. When I needed that, it made me realize that I wasn't walking in grace. Because if I'd understood grace, I would, have, I would have already accepted by faith all of those things that I was wanting to hear from him. He'd already told me all that in the Bible. He told me that through Christ. And yet somehow, because I was still performing, I was still trying to seek God's approval, I wasn't, I wasn't experiencing God's grace. And so John is saying that young men have come to the point of understanding it's all grace. They're saved by grace. They walk by grace. They're, they understand that they're pleasing to the Father, not because of their performance. They walk in obedience, not to somehow get his approval, but they walk in obedience to, to him because they've already got his approval. And they just want to love him. They want to serve him. They want to do the things that honor and please him. But they do it out of a position of already knowing they're standing with God and they're strong in grace. The other thing that is characteristic of, of spiritually young men is that they're on guard and they're men of courage. 
In 1 Corinthians uh, 16, verse 13, Paul tells the church, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. You see, spiritual young men understand that the Christian life is a warfare. I think a lot of times it's very, very easy for us as believers to receive Christ and then just want God to bless us and take care of our business, take care of our family, take care of all of our goals and objectives, and we, we're not thinking as warriors. We're not thinking as people in a, in a spiritual tug of war that is going to mark the ages and that one day will be over. We already know who the winner is, but many, many, many of us at different points in our lives have not thought as young men and have not thought of ourselves of, as people of tremendous spiritual courage because we're not thinking of ourselves as men and women in the battle of the ages. But young men think that way, and they're on guard. They're not walking around with their defenses down. They're, they're walking around ready for battle because they're in the word, they're in prayer, they understand the enemy, and they know what God expects of them and how to fight the warfare, to fight a good fight. And so young men and young women, uh, spiritually, are people who are on guard. They're ready for the warfare, and they're, they're, they're full of the courage that God gives them. The other characteristics of uh, young men and young women, uh, spiritually, is that they train themselves to be godly. They're in the process of continual training in walking with God. Again, Paul is talking to Timothy, and he tells Timothy, you are to train yourself to be godly. Physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding the promise for both the present life and for the life to come. And so Paul is saying that a spiritual young man or young woman who's developing in their walk with God is in training. They are working out spiritually. They are daily doing those things that help sharpen them, that help them grow deeper in their walk with God, and they are moving forward in their walk with God. They're not on vacation somewhere. They're not spiritually taking a break and taking it easy and just waiting for the king to come back. They are in training, and they're in training because they are in a battle, and they understand that, and they need to be on guard, and they need to be people of courage, and that can't happen if they're not physically trained. You know, the Christian life is not easy. It's a challenge, and it's a run to the finish, and it's a run of perseverance. It, it's not necessarily a race of speed. It's a race of endurance, and God will give us everything that we need to do it, but if we are not training ourselves, we are going to be in trouble. A number of years ago, I, I, um, I ran a marathon over in Honolulu, and it's a long story, but the short of it is I didn't train for this marathon. I planned on training, and I was so busy with ministry that I stopped training about four months before the race and gave up the idea, but I'd already signed up. And a friend of mine who'd run the marathon like about eight or nine times, always with like sub three times, which is very fast, said, oh, come on, Bob, the day before, just go for it. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll tell you what, this is wild, it's dumb, it's idiotic, it's crazy, but I'll do it. You know, I was a young young guy back then. So I said, let's go out for a, a run tonight. We'll go for six miles and I'll see how I feel. And if I feel good, I'll go. So we ran for six miles. I felt great. And um, so I ran this marathon the next day and, you know, ran the 26 miles. My time was nothing to, you know, jump up and down about. It was 440 or something like that. But I finished the thing. But the problem was, is the next day I, I couldn't walk. My toenails immediately fell off. My heart rate that night and I have a very low resting heart rate because I exercise and stuff. But that night, my heart would not stop beating. I thought it was going to jump out of my chest. And I was seriously afraid I was going to have a heart attack. And that's what happens when I try to exert a physical effort when I'm not properly trained physically. And it's very similar in the spiritual realm. If we are not properly trained for the battles that God has for us, we will be overwhelmed by them. We will not be ready for them, and we're going to be spiritually waiting for our, chest, our, our, our hearts to jump out of our chest and wonder if we're ever going to make it. But if we're in training and daily training, God will give us strength, and we will be able to run races that we would have never thought possible before. But it takes training. And a young man or a young woman who's spiritually developing as a believer has endurance because of daily, constant training so that they can run the race that God has before them. The other thing that, uh, that's characteristic of, of young men or young women spiritually is the evident discernible spiritual progress. This is something we just don't talk about much. 
We don't talk about evidencing spiritual progress. In fact, I often think that we don't even have an expectation of each other that there'll be discernible spiritual progress. In, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, again, Paul is constantly talking about these, these issues because he's talking to a young man, Timothy, and he's teaching him uh, as an adult father how he should be walking. He tells him in this chapter, he says, be diligent in these matters, the matters of faith. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Someone who's growing and developing spiritually in the Lord and has reached the stage of adolescence or, or young adulthood there should be discernible spiritual progress in their life. That means that people around you should be seeing, man, I'm seeing some changes in you. It's exciting. People that are in your circle of friends and family, if they're not telling you directly, should be scratching their head and say, wow, a year ago they would have responded so differently than they are right now. Something's happening in their life. And I think oftentimes, it's very easy for us to maintain the same pattern of response, even as Christians, not even expecting spiritual progress in our life or expecting progress in the way that we handle conflict or the way that we handle stress or the way that we handle worry or the way that we handle our finances or our relationships or whatever. And over the years, we just keep responding the same way as we did five years ago or 10 years ago. And Paul says that if we are to Consider ourselves spiritual adolescents growing up in the faith, becoming young men and women in the faith. We should see discernible progress in our walk with God. But again, if we're not training ourselves to be godly, if we're not understanding that we are in a warfare, and if we're not understanding that that's God's purpose, that we would grow up in the faith, then we can remain in that infant stage, just needing milk, needing our diapers changed, needing somebody to hold our hand all the time. And sometimes we all need that. It doesn't matter what stage of the game you're at. But one of the characteristics that differentiates a, an infant from a, a young adult is a level of responsibility that they can handle. A, a child, an infant, they cannot do anything for themselves. The only thing they can do is let you know that they're either content or unhappy. That's about it. And as they grow, the level of responsibility increases. Like when my son Johnny was just a baby, I had no expectations of him except that he was going to wake me up at night and that he was going to mess his diaper and that he would eat. That's the level of expectation I had. Now he's three. Now I have different expectations. He's, I expect him to clean his room, put his toys away. I expect him to behave. He doesn't always do it, but he's learning. I have certain expectations of him. And the expectations I have now are going to change because when he gets to be 15 or 20, I have a whole new set of expectations for him. And it's not so much that I'm putting pressure on him as much as, that, as I'm acknowledging that there's, a, there's a, a, a process of development that he should be in if he's developing normally. And in the Christian life, it's the same. We need to be developing and expecting that we will see progress, discernible progress in our lives. And not just to us, but other people should be seeing that in our lives as well. The other thing that, uh, that the young person does as they develop spiritually, if you look again at the verse, end of uh, verse 14, it says the word of God lives in them. And what I've uh, written here in your notes is that they hide God's word in their heart. They memorize scripture. You know, 15, 20 years ago in evangelical churches, everybody memorized scripture. You know, they had scripture memory quizzes. They called it... Uh, you know, sword drills, you know, for the word of God, sword. They had all this kind of stuff. It was just such a normal part. And now it's rare when you find believers who invest in memorizing the word of God. But this is an activity of spiritual men and women who are growing in their faith. They're young people who are advancing in the kingdom. And uh, in Psalm 119, 9 and 11, the psalmist says, how can a young man keep his way pure? by keeping it according to your word and by living according to your word. And it says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. And so scripture memory is just so key for spiritual development. I got hooked on scripture memory probably about uh, 12 years ago. And it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. I, I wouldn't want to compare it to anything else like reading the Bible or praying or anything because all those things are part of the same process. But when I can go stand in a shopping line 
and me reviewing scripture and having God feed me while I'm standing in a line or when I'm driving my car or when I'm running or whatever I'm doing, if I'm surfing, and I've got the scripture going through my head, I'm feeding myself. God is feeding me even when I'm out in a place where I can't open my Bible or it's not convenient. There are so many benefits to scripture memory, and I'll just list a few. The first is that it protects me from sin. You know, when I have a scripture in my head about maybe anger or being gentle and patient, and I'm in a situation where I maybe get frustrated, and all of a sudden, I've got a scripture, not because it came to me myself, but the Holy Spirit, I memorized it, the Holy Spirit prompts me to recall that scripture, and right there, God says, be gentle, be loving, be patient, whatever it might be, avoid that sin, go this direction, whatever the scripture might say, I am protected because I've hidden God's word in my heart. It's a, it's a, it's a wall of defense around myself, but there are other benefits. When I have the word of God in my heart, I'm, I'm ready any moment to share my faith anywhere, anytime, because I have God's word and I can tell people, I can give them the word of God. I don't even have to quote chapter and verse, I can just quote the verse to them and say, well, you know, what God says is this, and I can quote the scripture and I can be assured because of what it says in the, in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, that God's word will not return void, but it will go out and accomplish the purpose for which he sent it. So I'm always ready to give my faith away. There are so many benefits to scripture memory. I'll give you one more. I go on prayer walks quite a bit. And Harley and I actually went on his first prayer walk this morning around the church as we prayed through the church and just prayed for each of you as you would come in here today. And when I go on prayer walks, I, I have the word of God in my heart and I pray that scripture right back. I, I don't only pray it for myself, but you could take any verse in the Bible and use that as a springboard for praying for others, for praying for God's will in your life, for God's will in your family, for God's work in, in this church or in this community. And, and I've got that word and I can go anywhere and I can pray God's word using his own word and bringing it before him and asking God, do this work or protect the, these people from this particular area or work in their life in this particular way. And you know, I can't encourage you enough if you have not ever become involved in scripture memory, systematic, regular scripture memory, there are very few things that will change your life as radically as scripture memory. And so I encourage you, if you have any interest at all, I've got a number of, of systems that are very helpful, uh, some which you can purchase, some which I've made up myself. But whatever you do, give yourself to memorizing the word of God, hiding it in your heart so that it lives in you on a regular basis and it's constantly nurturing you. Now, there's one last characteristic of a young person that John mentions here in the last part of verse 14. He says they've overcome the evil one. This word overcome means that they've mastered the evil one. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't think of too many people that I know as believers who think of themselves having mastered the enemy. But that's what John is saying here. Does it mean they don't struggle? Absolutely not. Does it mean that they, there is not a warfare? Absolutely not. If you can think of it almost as a boxer, sparring and in the ring with another enemy, with another opponent, and that opponent is Satan, it's not that you, you can expect that you're not going to get hit or that you don't have to duck or that you don't have to do some defense every once in a while. And other times you're, you're moving forward and advancing and you're, and you're uh, on the offensive. There is a battle. But the spiritual young man or young woman who is growing in the faith has mastered the art of boxing, so to speak. They have learned how to win. They have learned how to overcome the enemy. And I've listed a couple of areas here. Um, um, let me just read you a, a, a verse here in Luke 10, 19, because Jesus is telling the disciples that they can overcome the enemy. And I want to tell you, you can overcome the enemy when you're attacked in your life. Jesus says to the disciples when he sends them out by twos, you remember when he sent them out for the first time in pairs to go out and do ministry in his name? He says, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. There are two areas I think that, um, that this really applies to. And in your, in your notes, you can see what those are. The first is uh, when the enemy comes and attacks or oppresses you in some way. Now, this is going to happen to all of us. There, there are times when Becky and I 
all of a sudden for no reason on a Saturday evening or time before ministry, we'll just feel all of a sudden a black depression hit us. And I'm not given to depression, but I have experienced it before. And all of a sudden, I'll just feel this sense of, oh, just heaviness, tiredness, like I can't get up, like I can't move. And, and I'll say, honey, what's going on? Are you tired? Yeah, she'll say, I'm exhausted and I feel really discouraged. And, and I'll say, you know, honey, there's absolutely no reason. Is there any reason you're feeling this way? And she says, no, everything's fine. I don't know why I'm feeling this way. And we recognize right away, this is a, this is a work of the enemy. A blackness just surrounds us. And I can't describe it except to say that the enemy is on the offensive and he's looking for someone to eat up. And he wants to eat us up and he wants to eat you up. So there are going to be times when we get attacked. And it's not just that kind of a spiritual oppression. There are times when he'll attack you through your spouse. There are times when he'll attack you through a coworker, or someone else, maybe even the body of Christ. And he'll come and he'll try to drag you away into conflict, drag you away into sin. And that is a spiritual attack. Sometimes it might even come in the form of your finances or your job or some other area where he just wants to rattle you and throw you off course. And God says you can have power over that. But you have to learn how to do warfare. And that is the activity of spiritual young men and women. Now, there's another area here that I've listed, and I've, I've, been, I've called that life-dominating sins. This is another area where we can have power and authority over the enemy. A life-dominating sin is a sin that you struggled with as a Christian and haven't overcome. This is something that um, might be, for some people, control. And interestingly enough, I found that more often than not, women struggle with this more than men do. Men have other struggles, but women have a, have a larger struggle with control, wanting to make sure that they don't get messed with, wanting to make sure that they don't get hurt again, or that somebody doesn't wound them in some way. And um, I, I'm not saying this because I'm just off the top of my head. I've done uh, uh, large seminars on this, and invariably, when the women get a chance to share what they struggle with, it's control somehow trying to control their husband or control their environment at home or keep their house spotless. There's, there are issues of having it just right, and, and they struggle with this issue of control. And that is a life-dominating sin because it has such a negative impact on so many areas, your family, your work life, so many things. And, and if that's an, a struggle for you, God can deliver you. It might be something else. You might have a life-dominating sin of struggling with finances, with wanting to get rich, with wanting to be wealthy, with wanting to have certain kinds, a certain level of lifestyle, you might want to be the best at what you do, but have not God's mind, God's work in mind, but your own glory in mind. There might be an area that you struggle with, some sort of addiction. Maybe you struggle with pornography. Maybe you struggle with some sort of addictive uh, drug, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or cocaine or something else. I don't know. But that's a life-dominating sin. And God says that you can be delivered from that. God can help you. I don't know what your struggle might be. Most of us have something that we have not been able to overcome. And I want to tell you that God can deliver you. And at some point in the, in the future, hopefully not too long from now, I'm going to teach on how to overcome life-dominating sins from a biblical point and a biblical perspective. Because we struggle with it. But the point is that John is saying is that a young man, a spiritual young man or spiritual young woman has overcome life-dominating sins and they know how to deal with the enemy. It doesn't mean they don't get attacked and they don't, don't get discouraged and they don't struggle, but it means they, they, they are not conquered by the work of the enemy. They have overcome it. The last area that John talks about is the maturity of fathers. And interestingly enough, he describes the fathers in the same way he describes the children. How did he describe the children? He says they've known the father. And how did he describe the, the, the fathers? They've known the father. Now, why would he do that? Why wouldn't he go on greater detail of, of the fathers and how they behave and, and their level of responsibility spiritually? Well, I think for primarily one reason. For those of you that have been in sports of some sort in the past or are currently in sports, when you first start a sport, the, the first thing you do is they teach you the basics. You know, like if you're playing basketball, they, you get out there and you learn to dribble the ball. 
And when you get the right hand down, then they work on the left hand. And then you dribble running, and then you dribble backwards, and then you, you know, get fancy dribble through your legs and all that stuff. But when you first start out on a sport like basketball or any other sport, you have to start out with the basics. You don't go to the advanced course. You start with the basics. You're not capable, technically or physically, of, of doing the advanced moves. But as you grow, then you move on to some more advanced skills. Like dunking, if you're, if you're in basketball, I can't jump. I'm the white man can't jump thing. I, I, I try, I'm tall, and I'm, I'm good for this, you know, and, and about maybe four inches of vertical. But I can't jump. But, but people that are skilled in basketball, as they get better, they learn to dunk, they learn to do reverse layups, they, their, their passing skills, their, their, their leg work, everything gets better and better and better. The trap for someone in basketball or any, any sport, for that matter, is that you get to a point where you, you start working on the advanced skills so much that you drift away from the basics. And that's when your game starts falling apart. And what a coach will do is that they'll get you back to the basics. They'll have somebody who's been playing basketball like Michael Jordan, and they'll tell him, I want you to dribble the ball for half an hour here, or I want you to do layups. And you know, why in the world do pro ball players need to do layups before the game? They've done this a zillion times. Why do they need to do it? because they've got to go back to rehearsing the basics, even right before the game. They're not doing that to impress anybody. Anybody can go and make a layup, but they're doing it because even pro ball players have to go back to the basics. And I think that first John, John is saying that, look, you once were a child and you knew the father, and you advanced in your growth with Christ. You became a young man or a young woman in the faith. You learned how to overcome the enemy. You learned how to hide God's word in your heart. And, uh, and, you, and you matured in your faith. But now, you need to go back to the basics and understand how to put all those skills together. And if you think of this in a, in a spiritual sense, I think what John is saying is that, fathers, you've known the Father, you've fought the battles, and you're still fighting the battles, but now you are falling more and more in love with your Savior. All of the pieces are coming together, and your, your faith is deepening. Everything that you've learned is strong and powerful, but now your faith is, is going deeper and farther than ever before, and you have known the Father. There are a few characteristics that I've listed down here that I think are characteristic of fathers. The first is they have a, a mature knowledge of God, of the Father. The second is they have a settled, consistent faith. You know, no longer do they go through these ups and downs, the hoop de doos that I remember going through as a younger believer, where one day I was just like rocketing. I couldn't get enough of Jesus. And the next three weeks, I wasn't even in the word at all. And I drifted away. And then I had to go to a service, get convicted, come up and get prayed for again. And then I'd rocket for a few weeks. And then I, you know, you know the story. We've all been through that. The inconsistency of, of the early Christian life, at least for me, it doesn't have to be that way, but that's the way my life was. But a father has developed a consistent faith where anybody knows that from year to year to year, their goals are the same, their objectives are the same, their consistency in their family life is the same. Not that they don't have some, some mild uh, ups and downs, but they don't have the, the big whoop de doos the roller coaster experience that a younger believer might. So they have a settled, consistent faith. The third thing is they're reproductive. Reproductive. This is so important. In 2 Timothy, Paul tells uh, Timothy again, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be able to teach others. And what he's teaching Timothy is he's, he's teaching them the multiplication process. He's saying, look, Timothy, I taught you how to walk in the faith. Now you find reliable men or women, as the case may be, and you teach them the very same things and multiply your life in, in those people. Now, a father... Is, is, is capable of reproduction. A young man is too, but, but generally, young adolescents aren't married. Now, our culture is completely skewed. It doesn't even seem to matter whether you're married anymore, whether you have kids or not. But according to God's plan, we're to be married before we have kids. Now, not all of us did that, and that's, you know, God forgives and, and we move on in, in obedience to Christ. But a father is, unless something's wrong, is capable of reproduction. And it should be a characteristic of that person's life. Uh, spiritually, at least, that there is a reproduction that's taking place. That means that a father, a spiritual father, has fruit in their life. And I'm not just talking about serving on a, on a, in some fashion in the church or doing some ministry or something. That's not, that's not reproduction. That's just serving. That's being a servant in, in the ministry. 
Reproduction means that you can point to someone and say, God, God gave me the privilege of leading that person to Christ. And not only that, but I've discipled them and now they are helping other people come to know the Lord as well. That's a father. That's someone who's spiritually reproductive. The last thing that's characteristic of a father is that they have an eternal perspective. They've given up on, on big homes and big cars and, and big dreams for themselves because they have submitted themselves to God's purposes for their life. And they have one objective in mind, and that's to live for eternal purposes. They aren't storing up for themselves any longer treasures on earth where moth and, moth and rust destroy, but they are storing up for themselves treasures in heaven where none of those things can touch or affect their life investment. And so the, the father has an eternal perspective. Now, let me just briefly talk to you about some hindrances to reproduction because I think this is so important. There are three things that can prevent us from being reproductive. And again, this is God's goal for us. You know, even if you think of uh, the Great Commission, go make disciples. He doesn't say a select few pastor leader types who have certain gifts go, go do ministry and make disciples. No, that word is for everyone. Go and make disciples. That discipleship process in, involves evangelism. It involves discipleship. It involves the equipping of another person to do the very same thing. It involves the whole ball of wax. And he says that, uh, that we are to have that kind of a lifestyle. And if we're not seeing fruit in our lives in that way, I don't want anyone to leave here discouraged about that. But I do want you to know that that's God's purpose for you, is that you would reproduce. In fact, if we're not reproducing, something is amiss in our spiritual lives somewhere along the way. And I'll tell you the three things that can be wrong here. The first is that from a human standpoint, you're not reproductive, at least if you're you know, not living in sin, if you're not married. If you're not married, you're not, you can't reproduce unless you're having some sort of a relationship outside of marriage. And basically, the, the correlation for the spiritual world is that if we're not united with Christ, there's no way we can re reproduce a spiritual harvest because we ourselves are not born again. We, we not, ourselves have not entered into that process of, of coming into a knowledge of Christ. And if we have not experienced it spiritually, we can't give birth to anybody else spiritually. So that's the first thing. The second reason, from, again, from going back to a, the human illustration of why we can't reproduce is that we've got some sort of disease or impairment of some sort, whether it's male or female. There's some sort of uh, impairment. I, I know when Becky and I were trying to have kids, we tried for four years and weren't successful. We went through the, all the testing and everything. Finally, she had an, uh, a laparoscopy. It's just a, you know orthoscopic surgery just to check out and see if everything was okay with her. And weird thing. Everything was fine. Everything was fine with me. And that next month, we got pregnant. But something, for whatever reason, God didn't allow us to get pregnant. And some people really struggle getting pregnant because something is physically wrong at some level. And they may or may not know what it is. But uh, on the, the uh, spiritual correlation is that there's some impairment in our spiritual lives that's blocking the way of fruitfulness. And the only thing that will block that is sin. In uh, Luke 8, 14, you remember where Jesus is teaching about um, uh, the sower? and the different types of ground, some on rocky, some on soil that was too shallow, uh, some on the path, and then some in good soil. Well, he says of the seed that fell among the thorns, he says that that stands for those who hear the word, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. So there's some people who, who aren't reproductive spiritually because they just are choked out by so many other things that they're not maturing. They're not growing in Christ. And I, I believe that if you pray, because I know it's God's will, that God will give you someone that you can bring into the kingdom. A friend, a family member. If you pray and trust God, I have no doubt that God will help you be reproductive. But you've got to have some of these other things in place. You've got to understand that it's God's goal for you to be reproductive that it's God's goal for you to grow into adolescence and to young adulthood and then into full adulthood as, as a believer in Christ and that you're not just consistently and forever locked into a stage of maybe uh, you know, a junior higher spiritually or even, even uh, you know, less than that. The last reason that, that, that a person may not be able to be reproductive spiritually or in a physical sense is immaturity. In um, 1 Corinthians, Paul says some very challenging things to the church. He says, brothers, I couldn't address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. 
So he's talking about believers, but he's saying they're worldly. They, they're consumed with the things of this world. And so much so that they've remained infants in the faith. He said, I gave you milk. In other words, he's saying, look, I'm trying to feed you. I'm trying to encourage you in your growth. And he said, I couldn't give you solid food for you weren't ready for it. And he said, indeed, you're still not ready. And man, that is a, oh, that's a rebuke. That's hard to receive. But it's a word that probably all of us need to hear that we, God has an expectation that we're going to move forward. In Hebrews uh, 5.12, the writer says, uh, though by this time you ought to be teachers, in other words, spiritual fathers helping other people make progress in their walk with God, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, still being an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, by, who by constant use constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Those are characteristics of a young man. Training, constant use of scripture, growing in the faith. So those are the three things that will keep us from being reproductive. Statistically, only about, um, I think it's only like about 15% of the people in the church have ever won anyone to Christ. Most of the evangelism is done by a handful of people who do most of the, of the uh, work and are, are the ones that are, are really oftentimes the most excited about their faith because they're right there on the battle lines, right in the front, uh, right, you know, right in the point, man. They're, they're right up there in the fray. It's like a quiet time or how to have a devotional life or how to pray or how to do evangelism or how to do spiritual warfare. All these things have to be taught. And if you leave them on their own, then they remain forever stagnant in this infant stage. And then what happens when they lead somebody to Christ? The best they can do is teach that other infant how to be an infant, because that's all they know. And the process comes to a screeching halt, and it leaves the church void of strong spiritual men and strong spiritual women who know how to give birth spiritually and how to raise up and train up a young person to the point spiritually where they, in turn, are ready to do the same for others. Let me just clarify one last thing, and we'll close. You don't have to be 10 years old in the Lord to be an adolescent spiritually. I know people, even in this church, who are young spiritually, who are moving on beyond being infants in the Lord, and who are taking responsibility for others, and have moved on to, a, to, uh, to being a young person in the Lord, or even uh, coming close to being an adult in the Lord. And they're only a few years old in the Lord. There are other people I've known in the past who were 15, 20, 30 years old in the Lord and were still infants. Physical chronology has nothing to do with spiritual maturity. Granted, you do need time. You can't, you can't become a mature adult overnight spiritually. There is a time factor involved. But if you apply yourself and walk with God, there's no reason why uh, a young believer can't bring someone, into the, someone else into the kingdom and help disciple them, even if they're only three or four years old in the Lord. They may not have overcome all the battles. It's not necessarily sequential that they move through these different stages. A brand new Christian can lead someone to Christ and be a spiritual father. And they need to get some help from, from an older believer on how to help that person grow. So it's not necessarily sequential. But I encourage you, recognize that God wants you to grow. That's his plan for you. He doesn't want you to remain infants, but to become spiritual adults, giving birth spiritually, training, discipling, and having grandkids and great-grandkids and great-great-grandkids in the faith so that when you come before God, you will be amazed at the thousands of people that your life has touched, people you have no idea as it's gone through this multiplication process. You get a few layers away from yourself and you don't even know all the work that's been done after that because it just spreads out so quickly. It's called multiplication. And I encourage you, give yourself to it. It lasts forever. It's the only thing worth giving yourself to. But you have to grow. And you have to be willing to mature in the faith. And that's what John is saying. We need to grow in Christ. We're encouraged. We're assured of so many things. And now, as a body of believers right here at, at uh, Calvary Chapel Kauai, let's move forward. There's some of you that may not have even begun the infant stage here yet. You've not been born again. I encourage you, begin the process. It will forever change your life. You'll never be sorry. Following the king is incredible. And whatever you're holding on to that may be holding you back from Christ, 
is garbage in compared to what he wants to pour into your lap. And maybe there's some of you that have been Christians a long time, but you recognize your spiritual infants. I encourage you, get some prayer. Open your heart to God's work. Recognize what he wants to do and then put a plan in place and move toward Christ aggressively in your growth. And for those of you that are adults giving birth, you're not really giving birth. I guess you're more like a, a, a midwife helping other people give birth. You're helping God's work in the Holy Spirit give birth to brand new believers. And I encourage you, keep going because what you are doing is eternal and it will last forever and you will not lose your reward. Let's pray. The Epic Life is a listener-supported ministry designed to encourage and equip believers to go big for God by loving Him, loving others, and making disciples. You can visit our website at theepiclife.org. God bless you.